นโมทัสสะบาวะโทอะระหะโทสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะบาวะโทอะระหะโทสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนโมทัสสะบาวะโทอะระหะโทสมมาสัมพุทธัสสะอาารุธาเดชะงามทัสสทวาราเยสุรวันธาบมุนชันทูสัตังโอ้ this is the Uposita day and we've all recited listened to renewed our commitment to the uh, precepts this is a convention uh, and the, when we chant you know when I gave the eight precepts the A few minutes ago, it's like this is a this see it sense of sila, and we know in that that holds things together. It's an agreement of how to live, how to behave, in ways that are moral and uh, harmless, so that our lives are in a community are based on the morality as a base. It just so that that isn't like living in the jungle. Survival of the fittest, and also its structure, convention, and though it has it, its limitation in that respect, but it's it's a way of agreeing on how to live. This is what we need very much in the world in general. Is that in the, all the political problems, the wars and conflicts that that seem to go on endlessly, uh, internationally and nationally. Is based on a lack of a common agreement about behavior, so it's all about power struggling and domineering and and uh, you know paranoia, fear, all of this kind of path- pathological mental states are are given so much uh, importance in our lives because we have no moral boundaries. We don't agree on how, you know, on just to refrain from uh, harmful acts, harmful speech. So this is this is this is one of the great gifts of being human is that we can make these agreements. You know, we can decide. You know, this, we feel like we're going to be we're naturally moral beings because we do we get angry and violent and. Lustful and jealous and fr- all the rest, uh, but in terms of behavior and speech, we take the responsibility for what we do, what we say, uh, towards ourselves, towards each other, towards the environment. And then the uh, practice of meditation. Developing, cultivating awareness is uh, this is our sole aim now. Is not to negotiate endlessly on the conventional level for what I want or what I think, but uh, just this idea of surrendering, of accepting. This is agreement on behavior, and then our attention can be solely on the mental states. Emotional states that arise and cease in our lives here. Now that sounds convincing enough. It's, it's, I'm using words, and it sounds reasonable. And uh, but it, but my mindfulness is not about being reasonable or anything. It is a, it is the only way that we have as individual human beings to uh, be free from. The limitation of convention, being free from the limitation of delusion, of greed, and hatred. Otherwise, we have no, there's no, no other way we can do. It. We can kind of try to be good and and uh, and kind of suppress any kind of negative feelings or habits or intentions. We get psychologically neurotic because of the guilt we feel about. You know, wanting to be a good person and then having angry, vicious feelings sometimes. 
So, you know, in a society such as ours, modern Western society like here, is very much based on this dualism, uh, structure of thought, of, of uh, one extreme and its opposite. So notice that the conditioned realm is about extremity. It's good, bad, right, wrong, beautiful, ugly, all the rest. Uh, whenever you have one quality, you have its opposite. If you have heaven, then there's hell. There's right, there's wrong, good and bad. And the, in our culture, our civilization is very much based on this dualism of trying to to be good and create goodness and democracy and fairness and equality uh, because that's the aspiration or the kind of uh, that we have. We have high aspirations wanting to, to have the best. We can create images of what's best, of how things should be, of utopian societies and perfect political systems and social systems. But then in the reality of our experience is always here and now. It's not about the future and how it should be trying to work for the future, but to, to keep reminding ourselves of the present, the reality of here and now. And that's where the breath, because the breathing is here and now, the body is here and now, sound of silence here and now and whatever you're feeling you know happy sad elated depressed indifferent whatever the emotional state you're in or condition that you're experiencing at this moment say emotionally it is it is uh, something that arises and ceases so what this is saying is a, is awakened consciousness and uh, recognize that, that we're experiencing consciousness through a form. Now we have a corpse in the um, Chapel of Rest. And many of you may have gone to visit uh, the young lady that died uh, last week. And, uh, and it has a picture, photo of her when she was alive, pretty young uh, girl from Malaysia. And then then this corpse in the coffin, which is uh, beginning, getting uh, ripe and uh, discolored, and that, and this is this is the practice of is not a, a kind of perverted fascination for death or corpses that we're encouraging, <laughs> but uh, uh, contemplating. This is the way things are. You know, the body, our bodies will someday be like that. And they're dead. They see, that body is no longer a conscious form. The life force that was in it uh, a couple of weeks ago is gone. And so its nature is to decay. And that's its natural state, is, is, uh, is the body is decaying. Now we attach very much to identity with the body, don't we? We're very much, uh, you know, culturally conditioned to identify with uh, being male or female, being uh, whatever race, black or white, or young or old, beautiful or ugly, fat or thin, tall or short. I mean, these are strong identities that uh, are culturally conditioned and, and not questioned usually, just taken for granted. Because on the condition level, uh, culturally conditioned, I'm conditioned to see myself in terms of I'm this body, I'm this person, this, this nationality, this, uh, I'm an Ajahn, I'm a Buddhist monk, I'm a American, I'm on and on like that. I'm 74 years old, uh, the age of the body, white, <laughs> and so forth. 
But as you can see, when we reflect on that, these are these are conditions that we acquire. We're not born with this identity. We don't. We aren't born. Uh, uh, you know, the first thought is, "I am this body. I'm a little boy. I'm a little girl. I'm a little white boy." And all that kind of thing. Never. That came on later, isn't it? That's part of the cultural conditioning. And yet these are the very things that we commit ourselves to, is this identity that we acquire, a conditioned identity that becomes so fixated on it that we, we can't get out of it. We have no way of seeing it in perspective. We're merely stuck in it. And because it is unsatisfactory to be stuck blindly in, in conventional, in conditioning, then we suffer a lot because as much as we would like to be happy and free and fair and beautiful and, and healthy and young, this is the way it is. The, you know, the body gets sick and dies. Decay is a natural state, you know, it's a, that's why we encourage you to observe it. Like when you go into that chapel of rest, you know, just observe your own mental state. Some people <coughs> have never seen a dead human body before in their lives. Or well, they're afraid of it. Maybe you're, you think it's, a, you know, there's kind of ghosts or spirits or something frightening about corpses. Culturally, we have different attitudes about dead bodies. But what we can do is be aware. I'm not asking you that there's any attitude or feeling you should have about it, but to encourage you to be aware of what you do feel. It's like this. Not to judge it and say, if you feel aversion and disgust or fear or not wanting to to look, it's like this. If you feel interested and fascinated with, with this, it's, it feel, you know, this is the feeling, you can recognize the feeling of being interested or being repelled. Notice the odor, because we don't like odors like that of decaying corpses. So we burn incense and and try to, you know, keep it from getting too uh, unpleasant because <laughs> uh, there's uh, bad odors, decay, corpses, usually, you know, a very uh, repulsive odor to us. But we can be aware of that, of the, of the repulsion. It's like this. When something stinks, it's like this. It's aware of, of uh, you know, not seeing, not add anything to it, but just observing, being the observer, the Bhutto, the Buddha, knowing the Dhamma. We can live in a totally artificial way, you know, in a modern society like here in, in uh, Britain. We could spend our lives just on uh, computer screens, television, in air-conditioned uh, flats, and in 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 uh, heated automobiles and and uh, shopping centers that have music playing in them that are you know heated and warm and pleasant in the winter time constant daylight we have electricity we can live in a you know so that the the natural flow the way nature is ex as experience is is we don't have to bear with its unpleasant side. We can always switch on a light when it's dark. We can, uh, you know, learn to keep warm. We have central heating, and we have, you know, in this temple last winter, uh, winter before last, we couldn't use the temple because the heating, central heating didn't work. Sit here and get cold. But this winter we could sit here very comfortable. In fact, it was too warm for some of you because they repaired the underfloor heating and some of you couldn't stand it, it became too hot. Sitting on a hot floor in the hot seat. 
But whatever it is, it's like this. Uh, this is the way it is. The suchness. Now, th this way of talking, language itself is very limited. So, this is where when you grasp anything I say, you know, and kind of hold on to, is it's not what I'm encouraging you to do, to believe or to grasp what I say. When I'm talking like this, I'm using language as a reminder or an encouragement, a sense of wake up and look, you know, observe. It's not to, it's not meant to be, you know, uh, something that, that you grasp. Like I say, wake up, it's not, you know, you have to grasp what I'm saying. <laughs> it's an imminent act. You know, I'm lost in myself, in my worries, in my habits, in my emotions, and then wake up and suddenly I'm, this sense of puto, present. Mindfulness. Now consciousness then is, uh, you know, it, it has no boundary. Like, like the body died, that lady, her body's dead. You know, that form is now in the process of decay and will be cremated in a few days. <clears throat> but uh, consciousness is not dead. So this is where you, you know, the, the, this is when we identify the body and consciousness as being, you know, that the consciousness is dead and therefore the, the body's dead. The body's dead because it was born and then it, it you know, then the conditions uh, happened, illness, and then the, those created the conditions for the body to die. But consciousness didn't die. So when we're uh, aware, then we're in the pure state of consciousness. This is where this awakened, enlightened state is, is being fully aware, present. Recognizing, realizing consciousness is this. And then the, uh, you know, the thoughts come and go, feelings, emotions, Heat and cold, pleasure, pain, greed, hatred, and delusion, uh, all the rest, the conditions, uh, the karma, you know, come and go in, 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 one, in consciousness. So in, in taking refuge, in Buddhist terminology, when we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, we're taking refuge in consciousness, recognizing liberation, from the death-bound conditions of the body or the personality. Like just the idea that you are a person uh, and that sense of being a separate person is conditioned, isn't it? It's not something natural that you're born with. You're not born with a personality. It's, it's, uh, it, you acquire that after birth. But any, you know, when you're born, you're this consciousness. The body is born and it's conscious. And after, after you're born, then you acquire the sense of yourself, your identity, being male or female, being black or white, British or French or Scottish or good, bad, beautiful, ugly, and so forth. That all comes later. So when we're practicing awareness, recognizing it, then it, we're recognizing the natural, the reality, a natural reality that's not created out of ignorance, not a personal identity, but it's real, it's reality. So when we contemplate the Four Noble Truths, the Third Noble Truth is about reality. That condition, like the the cessation, the death, the body in the chapel of rest, dead body. That, and that's naturally going into its state of decay. <coughs> but consciousness is not dead. 
So, in, now I'm not asking you to believe this. This is just an encouragement, a way of reflecting. Because we tend to think of consciousness in a personal way. My consciousness, your consciousness, two consciousnesses. Uh, I'm, my consciousness is in my head, my brain, or my, you know, and then your consciousness is in your body. So the lady in the chapel of rest, her consciousness died along with the body. And, uh, and then we can, and that's generally how the society, the culture that we live in, that's how we think, that's how we, we uh, believe, that's our belief, our conditioned attitude. She's no longer conscious, she's dead. Now what I'm pointing to, or what the Buddha's pointing to, is, is the deathless. The gate to the deathless is open. There is the unborn, uncreated. Ati, ajatang, aputang, akatang, asankatang. There is the unborn uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So that is a statement of fact. Is a, you know, when the Buddha, in the Pali canon, that kind of language then, is, is stating a fact. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. It's not saying, I believe that there is such a thing as the unborn and uncreated. I rather like the idea, and and uh, so of such great philosophers of the past have said that they also believe in the unborn and unconditioned. And I cry, and then another, then you could say, well, I don't believe in this. Prove it, unborn, unconditioned, what is it? Bunch of rubbish. Just wishful thinking, sentimentality. That's a cynical view. Now, this is not a metaphysical speculation, or philosophical speculation. This is, this is awakened attention. This is being fully present here and now to Dhamma, the way it is. Now when I do this, then there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unco un unconditioned. Now in my practice over the years, that is uh, this is a fact. This is real. This isn't. This isn't a belief or, or some kind of made-up state that I that I that I can create through believing in Buddhism. It's through awakened attention, through investigation of the way it is. You be, you recognize this. This is reality. What arises ceases, what is born dies. That's, so this, the reality is cessation. For instance, if whatever I feel, you hear, you know, you hear good news or bad news, pleasant, unpleasant, and so forth, and then these things reach, you know, reach your consciousness. So somebody says, gets, tells me something unpleasant, it feels like this. But if I, if I just react to some, some unpleasant news, then I get caught, I go into a spin of habit, you know, of, oh, how, it's not fair, I don't like this, it's wrong, and how can people act like that, and I don't want the world to be like this. And I caught in the, you know, kind of emotional, uh, my emotional habits, the, my personal habits that I've acquired. And then that always leads to suffering because there's, you know, you notice most of the news these days is negative. It's all, it's a very fear, frightening time from, you know, worldwide. It's not just, don't take it too personally because it's everywhere. It's the kind of aramana or uh, attitude that is, is prevalent uh, worldwide. Paranoia and fear. Terrorism. Um, you know, the kind of terrorists are, are very frightening because they could be anybody. 
You know, during the Cold War, we had a, we felt more, it wasn't so frightening because we knew where the enemy was. <laughs> now we don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in, in Heathrow or in uh, the, the train station, and it could be uh, outside the gate, could be inside, we might have a terrorist inside the Amravati, who knows? And then because it's the unknown and the fear and this is, and we can create this fear uh, and generate it through the media. But in reflecting then, we are, we, we are awakened to the way it is, like fear arises and ceases. And that which is like when I do feel, when the fear arises because of the power of awareness, then I'm aware of, of it arising. And having investigated uh, conditioned phenomena, what arises ceases, then I'm also aware when it ceases. So in this awareness, I'm quite willing to experience fear or w anger, or whatever. A conditioned world is not, is not controlled, not uh, approved or disapproved of, it is received in this kind of welcoming way. You're willing to, to accept whatever arises and ceases for what it is, because you're seeing it now in terms of its of Dhamma rather than in terms of its quality of pleasant or painful, good or bad. As soon as I get lost in the dualism of pleasant, pleasant and pain, painful, then I get caught in liking and disliking, wanting and not wanting. And, and, if, and through heedlessness, then I, then I react to wanting the pleasant, more of the pleasant, not, and wanting to get rid of the unpleasant or the painful. See, so mindfulness then cultivated, bhavana, is, is uh, recognizing, realizing, this is the deathless, this is the unborn, uncreated. Now there's nothing that I can describe. You know, it, it, well, how can you, it, because it is not, doesn't have a quality of good, bad, right or wrong, pleasant or painful. But it's certainly recognizable. So this is in the, that paradigm of the Four Noble Truths that you know, encourage you to use that to investigate your experience uh, on a, you know how you experience life personally their habit tendencies because suffering dukkha the first noble truth is a common common uh, experience that we all have every human being every creature And it's out of ignorance of Dhamma that we suffer. Now in terms of getting old, you know, and sickness, death, old age sickness, death, these are natural states of the body. What's born, it grows up, gets old, gets sick, dies. And so the, the body in the chapel of rest, that's its natural state, death, decay, The personality is gone. If we, I didn't know her, so I don't have memories of her as a as a personality. But when somebody dies that I know, then I look at their corpse and I, I, I would trigger off memories. I remember when she said this and when she did that and on and on like that. And I, you know, looking at that. Corpse. If I if I knew her before she died, then I would have memories, but I don't have memories of of that uh, corpse, other than the ones that I've acquired after after she died. So this is an awareness of the way it is, being young, only thirty years old. That's interesting one, and in that when somebody. 95 years old and dies, it's, it's, 
it isn't quite, you know, there's something much more sad about death of a young person. So, you know, this pretty young girl, young woman, died, 30 years old, of cancer, and there's a certain feeling uh, that I can recognize, that I experience. Even though I didn't know her personally, just the idea of a young woman uh, dying uh, of cancer is, it has this, this pathos to it. It's like this. So it's not, it's not, I'm not trying to say, give any kind of advice on what you should feel, but the way you, you do feel is like this. And then this, this welcoming acceptance is non, non-judgmental, is not critical. So you, as soon as you start criticizing what you're feeling, you're lost again, back in the habit of, I should feel or I shouldn't feel this way. You see, so the thinking mind is dualistic. And if all you do is think and grasp ideas and thoughts, then you're, you're stuck in the realm of suffering. There's no way out through thinking about it, through analysis, through reason or logic. You're stuck in, in the death realm. But then awakening, awakening to the deathless, there is the unborn. Ati, ajatdang, aputang, akatang, asankatang. And if there was not the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned, there'd be no way out. There'd be no way. We'd be we're stuck forever in the vortex of conditioning. They're just you know they're just caught in in the in that cycle of thoughts of likes and dislikes and habits that we, that, you know, we, we just go around with that. So then there, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Therefore there is the escape. And that escape is always here and now. It's not about if I practice hard, maybe next year I'll have a real insight and escape the created and the form. Don't buy into that way of thinking anymore. It's not about next year or practicing hard or doing anything, but awakening here and now. Now this really is uh, it's very direct and, and um, sometimes you don't want to awaken. We like our own delusions sometimes. Some bad ones we like to get rid of. There are certain Delusions we're quite fond of. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but that's where it's, uh, you know, the, this uh, investigation. They're not grasping the idea that I've got to get rid of all my delusions or let go of everything. I've got to practice hard in order to get rid of, I've got to surrender and get rid of all my delusions. Or the feeling that, well, I can, you know, you know, I've still got time left, I can still be deluded for a while, and maybe in the future, just before I die, I'll have a real, you know, real heavy retreat and <laughs> break through it. So, and that's all the self-view, isn't it? You know, I'm, I am, uh, I like my delusions, I shouldn't like them, I should dedicate my life to the Sangha, to be free from delusion, is, is an aspiration. But really observe this sense of I should and I shouldn't, I am and I am not. And that's where, you know, this why I encourage you to look at the, the assumption that I am an ignorant, unenlightened person who needs to practice in order to become enlightened in the future. Because we all begin with that, and I began with that. That's what, you know, I felt hopeless when I started meditating. 
I'm a really deluded person. I'm an emotional wreck. And I'm going to practice in order to be free from this suffering. And I'm going to practice hard because I, I'm probably such a hopeless case it'll take, you, you know, my whole life. I, know I wasn't particularly optimistic about myself in those days. And so, um, and then, then this, this seemed to be fair enough, an adequate description of how I felt about myself at that time. And then, you know, as I started meditating, I, I, I've got to get the samadhi, I've got to get the jhanas, I've got to get this level of, of concentration as they describe in the text. I've got to develop this level of samadhi in order to do the vipassana, and I've got to uh, practice vipassana uh, you know, to investigate uh, mindfully all the, the six ayatanas and the five khandhas and the uh, twelve indriyas and on and on like that. And, go <laughs> and so you, you read all the texts and, you, and you're still operating from the I am position. Because interpreting the Pali Canon from the ego is what we do. We read the Pali Canon from the position of a self, from, an, from this deluded self position. I'm unenlightened and I've got to practice in order to become enlightened. Now notice that this is, on the conventional level, that is how it seems, on a, that's how it seems personally. But then the awakened state, when you're talking about Buddha Dhamma Sangha then, what this means, Buddha is nothing more than the awareness in the present. It's not some kind of special being that, that, that came uh, and uh, gave a teaching 2,550 years ago and, and now we're waiting for the next one. When we, when we take refuge in the Buddha, this, this is a, a reminder, awareness, wake up here and now. It means awakened consciousness. It doesn't mean that I'm a Buddha, but it means that there is this consciousness and then I remember it, and I can be conscious, be aware. That's taking, that's Bhutang Sarnangachami. And what I, I'm aware of Dhamma then, I'm not aware of myself anymore as this, you know, going around with the, what I think and feel and believe in or what not. Uh, where when I'm operating from the self-view, you know, Ajahn Sumato position, then I, I'm a Buddhist monk and I'm blah, 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 blah and I get caught in, in the conventional identities. So I'm not seen dumb anymore, I've become a personality with, with all kinds of memories and views, opinions, emotional habits that I've acquired over 74 years. You know, so you, you know, if you don't, if you, if you do nothing but live your life heedlessly for 74 years, oh, I'd be a real mess by now. Because the conditioning, you know, was not based on wisdom. It wasn't, it was moral, it was good enough, you know, I'm not complaining about it, but it was still based on ignorance, on vanity, on a sense of self, on illusions, on delusions, on beliefs, on assumptions, cultural attitudes, ideals of how things should be. <coughs> So that's why I encourage you to really to listen. To, don't think you shouldn't have an ego. That's another ego, isn't it? I shouldn't have an ego, but know the ego. And I say the word Sakya Ditti, the first fetter. It's the thinking process. I'm Majan Tomato, that's Sakya Ditti. I am this per I'm this I'm a man. I'm an American, I'm 74 years old. This is, you know, attachment to these perceptions is the sense of a self, or Sakya Ditti, or the ego. I'm unenlightened and I need to practice hard in this lifetime in order to become enlightened. 
That's based on thought, isn't it? On views that I am this person. I'm not what I would like. To, I'd like to be enlightened, but I, re you know, I, I'm, I don't feel enlightened, so I'm not. I'm, and I've got to become enlightened, which I'm not quite sure what that is, from the ego position. But it sounds pretty good. And then hopefully I'll be able to get it before I die. That's a thought pattern, you know. So listening to that thought pattern, that which is aware of thinking, is not thinking. So in, in you know, your tendency to think and, and uh, feel all this, the awareness of it is switching on this light. It's a floodlight. To see the self, the sakyaditi, for what it is. It's nothing, it's not judging it, it's, you shouldn't have any psychedity, but to know it. It's, it arises and ceases. Thoughts and memories come and go, don't they? I've never found any memory I can keep. I keep having to revive it. Thoughts move very quickly. Emotions, you know, they linger longer than thoughts, but they, you can't sustain emotions. You can indulge in them and try to keep them and, and feel that they're never going to go away, but they do eventually. You know, no matter how much you, you know, how you try to get rid of them. So instead of trying to get rid of negative emotions, welcome them. The sense of opening, receiving life, the conditioned realm in all its aspects, good, bad, right, wrong. So your relationship to the condition realm is knowing, receiving, because it's teaching us about conditioned phenomena. So even the negative conditions, the, the nastiness, the meanness, the anger, resentment, or greed, or whatever, you know, whatever words we want to label these emotions, they are what they are. And conditional phenomena, then we, we're, our relationship to it is knowing, not judging, not liking or disliking it. So then we have this perspective, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. Therefore there is the escape from the born, the created, the formed, the conditioned. So then, because we don't, we can't, we can't make the unformed, uncreated, unborn into a picture, you know, something you can believe in or grasp. It's a negation in itself, it's an abstraction, but it's reality. The word points to this reality. Pure consciousness here and now is nothing more than this. Now I've trained myself with the sound of silence because I, when, when there's this awareness on this vast scale, unlimited, unbounded reality, I notice this, what I call, sound of silence. Now, using that, re recognizing it, surrendering to it, then, then I notice the sense of a self disappears. If I create, I've got, I've got to get the sound of silence. I've got to keep, you know, then I start creating myself around it because I, I, I grasp the, uh, the idea of sound of silence. And that's not what I'm recommending, that you believe in it or grasp it. But recognize it. It's, it's here and now, like the space, the air. It has no boundary. And as you accept it, float in it. I have notebooks in my kuti, just f pages filled with silence, silence, silence. Right, right, silence. Just to keep the, that sound of silence in it. Just to stay with it. Because it's so easy to, to go, you know, for me, my, I'm a great thinker, habitual obsessed thinker. So just wander away in thought. The same mala beads and all this kind of thing, just using everything. I'd even, you know, take my fingers. Sound of silence. 
just to just to sustain this awareness on this empty consciousness. This is conscious that that habit tendencies to forget it and get caught into thinking and and planning and worrying and remembering the past and and the problems in the community, worry about this, uh, feelings of distress or anxiety or infatuation or boredom and, and that come and go. But this, this awareness then, this sound of silence, it sustains itself. I don't, I don't create it. I just awake and notice it. There's no sense of a self in it, but there's still consciousness. So this does not, this is, this is the deathless, the amravati, the unborn. Okay. Then the, the death is the thinking process, emotional habits, Memories, the body, feelings, pleasure, pain, sense experience, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. These, this, these things change and arise according to other conditions that we don't have all that much control over. So that's where this awakenness is so, is the whole essence, the quintessence of the Buddhist, uh, of the Buddha sasana. It's a wake up, wake up and know directly this, there is the unborn. Okay. When Christians ask about whether God exists or not or whether you believe, it, you know, you're, uh, you're still forming views about God as somebody, something. Or the atheists will say, there, well, I don't believe there isn't anything as God. You know, it's just hocus pocus from the past. Because you're trying to, you know, when I try to define and limit the deathless, it's nonsense, doesn't it? It doesn't, you know, there's no boundary. How It's not beautiful or ugly, good or bad, right or wrong. But if I say the deathless is always good and it's happy and it, it's wonderful and it's, it's fantastic. Then, then that might inspire you, but you're you're being wound up with with inspiring concepts that you can't sustain. You can't sustain something as absolutely good and wonderful and beautiful and fantastic. So it's not like that. It's out. You know, it's not fanta absolutely fantastic or horrible, because those are the extremes of thinking and the dualistic condition realm. So there is the unborn, uncreated, and it's recognizable here and now. It's, it, it, it's reality. You can know it yourself, uh, an individual human entity, and recognize it, and then we cultivate it. So the fourth noble truth is the real pawana, you know, that's where you really, that's where meditation and with this word bhavana begins is, is the fourth noble truth. Cultivating or developing through samaditi, right understanding. Or knowing this is the deathless, this is it. And then, then in daily life here, you keep reminding yourself, this is the deathless. So, you, you know, things happen and praise and blame and success, failure happen, but the deathless is my refuge, not, not a success or failure, praise or blame. And so that's, that, you know, encouraging this to be the priority, You're going forth, bapa cha, that kind of thing, that, Ceremony is about going forth to real to reality, to the deathless. 
It's not about personal privileges or views and opinions anymore. It's not about right and wrong, good and bad. Or any, any concepts, but it's awakened individual human beings awakening to Dhamma, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. So when we talk about Sangha, taking refuge in Sangha, Supatipano Ujupatipano, means that it's the individuals that who are practicing, who are cultivating, who are aware. The four pairs, the eight kinds of noble beings. So you've got these, these, uh, these ways of describing it. The Sotapanna, Sakadara, Kamyanaka, and Arahan. These are not personal identities or attainments. You know, it's, it's sometimes really pathetic in Theravada Buddhism how people will take these words and identify them. People wonder, you know, people ask whether I'm an Arahant or not. Or maybe, you know, maybe I'm only a Sotapanna. Or maybe I'm just a, still a Batuchan after 42 years. You know, some unenlightened, but nicer than I was before. <laughs> I mean, these are grasping words and concepts from the ego again, isn't it? When I think I'm a, I'm a arahant or I'm not an arahant, that is still the, 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 the self-identity, the limitation of language. So in uh, this awareness, this, 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 the reality of the unborn, uncreated, then everything resolves itself there. There's nobody, no person. Qualities come and go and change. The sense of yourself as an individual personality comes and go and changes. But you're no longer interested in that. I'm not interested in my personality and and have any acts to grind around that or, you know, needs around personal needs and trying to, to sustain myself and, and uh, all that, even though those kind of conditions can still arise in consciousness, there is the recognition of what arises ceases. The refuge is in puto tamo sanko, not in my personal views and opinions. So this is, you know, this is the, the, the kind of beauty of this particular convention. It's, it's uh, very simple, very direct. Even though Buddhism can present, be presented, and so oftentimes is presented so complicatedly that, you, you know, it boggles the mind. You think, oh God, I can never, you know, there's so much to it. You read the, all the Abhidhamma, treatises and, and you, you go crazy trying to figure that stuff out with an unenlightened self-view. <laughs> you know, so you, <laughs> you know, you're just, you're just playing around with concepts. And there's no, you know, that one just gets confused by that or conceited. One can create an ego around, I'm, I'm an Abhidhamma scholar and I'm, you know, I have a PhD in, in Sanskrit and Pali and then I'm somebody who, who achieved something. That's a worldly view. But if there's nobody, there's no achievement, no, nobody gets enlightened or nobody attains anything, that sounds, well, why bother then? Why bother becoming a monk and being brahmacharya and eating a like they're not eating dinner in the evening and so forth. Might as well, if there's nothing to it, why not just eat, drink, and be merry? Have a, have a good time. So it's not like, the, you know, in the dualistic, right? then it's, uh, it's, it's uh, eat, drink, and be merry, or, you know, you've got to give up everything and become an ascetic, and any kind of pleasurable thing is sinful. We can get very puritanical and rigid and moralistic about it, you know, and see, see pleasure and beauty as dangerous and bad and tempting and I don't know, like that, which, 
We're certainly in a culture that does that, in the puritanical attitudes of Christianity. are part of our cultural conditioning. But this is, Buddhism is not puritanical, not about right and wrong or good and bad or sinfulness. It's about ignorance and awareness, awakening to Dhamma. It's not about judging each other in terms of morality or ability or personality, is it? It's about encouraging each other to awaken. I can't order you to, I can't, you know, you've got to wake up. It's an encouragement. We need that, we need this kind of encouragement. And you can do it, you know, just trust yourself more. You know, don't, don't believe all what you think you are in all your views and opinions and how your feelings and emotions, your you know, or don't believe it. It is what it is, and not nothing to to suppress, but recognize, realize, condi- all conditions are impermanent, not self. There is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. There is the deathless. So this is our refuge. So if the body dies. It, that's what dies. Not a person. Not a, you know, the consciousness doesn't die, the body dies. So, offer this for your reflection.